my fiance and I moved into a little neighborhood in eastern Kentucky back in 2019. It was a nice little place for the most part. They liked to have block parties, and just about everyone would participate in one way or another, and the demographics were all over too. There were people close to our age, with and without kids, some older people, and even a guy that seemed a little out there but otherwise was mostly harmless. Surprisingly, the story isn't even about him. Rather, it was about our direct next-door neighbor, Martha. Martha started as a pretty normal neighbor. As we were moving in, we would catch her watching us from her front window or standing out on her porch, sweeping or dusting off her porch swing. Little things like people do, under the guise of being nosy. We were the new people, though, so it was no big deal to us. As we continued moving and getting settled in, she would smile and wave at us, but there wasn't much else in ways of contact from her. One day, after reorganizing and some unpacking, we ordered a pizza, and since it felt so nice out, we sat out on the porch with two fold-out chairs and just enjoyed the night. And that's when we officially met. She was taking out a bag of trash when she called out to us, so we started talking. She introduced herself, said that she had been divorced for over 20 years and that she got the house. She seemed to brag that she was pretty well made with the alimony and the few lawsuits that she had won. Kind of weird, but it was whatever. We introduced ourselves, and when I mentioned fiancé, she did what most people did and asked when the wedding was. We said that we were just planning on having a small ceremony at the courthouse with a few close people, and then she practically scoffed. She spoke directly to Jackie, my fiancé, telling her that she hoped I was worth it if I wasn't willing to give her the world and have an extravagant wedding and then told her not to settle. She laughed about it afterwards, but it was still kind of rude at first. Getting married was important to both of us. A large, expensive ceremony was not. I even asked her many times if she was sure this is what she wanted, and she agreed. I had to convince her to at least have a nice dinner party afterwards with just our close friends and family, because all of it really was not a big deal for her. But after that conversation, she just kind of lingered and then said that she would leave us be, and went back inside. We just chalked it up to having one of those neighbors and left it alone. A few months later, we were pretty well settled in, and since it was close to autumn, we wanted to start working on the backyard so it would be ready for us in the spring. There were a lot of dead vines along the privacy fence. Weeds all over the raised garden bed in the back. In the area that we wanted to use to start our own produce garden with. As well as some other potentially nice bushes that just needed some extra TLC. After cleaning it up a bit, we had some music playing and just sat out back drinking a beer and enjoying our work. Shortly after... Martha comes out back and again starts talking to us. We mentioned what all we did, and Jackie offered to let her through the back so that she could see, and she agreed. She came over and she seemed impressed with what we had done. When Jackie started mentioning her plans for part of the yard, Martha cut her off. You need to get rid of those ugly bushes over there. They make it impossible for me to see into your yard with them there. I tried telling the couple that lived here before, but they never listened. Taken aback, I just looked at her, not sure how to respond, when Jackie laughed and said that she had no intentions on removing them. She said that they were pollinator bushes, so they were good to have, but that she would keep them trimmed so they weren't going over the fence to her side, but they were staying otherwise. Martha did not seem happy with this response and told us basically, well, it's your yard, I guess, and pretty much left after that. We both agreed that we may just put in more if we had to. From then on, Martha seemed to be against us, 
or more so against Jackie for the longest time. If we were outside, she would smile and wave at me, but the moment Jackie came around, she would grimace and walk away. She would greet me at the mailbox, but would hurry along or even stand in front of our mailbox while she went through her own, blocking Jackie from being able to get to the mail. One of the worst things she tried was when Jackie was coming home from work, Martha was in our front yard and stopped her. She asked Jackie why there were so many different young girls coming and going from our home. When she questioned this, Martha claimed that she saw three or four really young and pretty girls visiting when she was gone, and that she thought about calling her but didn't have her number, hinting towards getting it from her. Jackie told her that she would handle it and walked away, only angering her more that she was denied her phone number, and I really don't understand her reasoning for even wanting the number. Jackie, of course, told me what she said, which is how I know, and thankfully neither of us are the jealous type. She knew it wasn't true. The only other women that ever came over to our house were our moms, my sister, or sometimes Jackie would come home with a friend, but that was it. It seemed to anger Martha more knowing that whatever she was scheming was not causing a rift between us. But it didn't seem to stop her. She tried to do all these little things to get under Jackie's skin at first. Jackie had a few yard ornaments out front. The front yard did not have a fence, and they would be slightly moved. She had a ceramic flamingo wearing a Hawaiian shirt sitting by the steps up to our door. Martha had moved it to the edge of our yard. I work from home and have always been a pretty big tech guy, so we've had security cameras since day one. We reviewed the cameras and we watched her pick it up and move it. Why though? We thought we would ignore it for a while, but after she did the same thing twice more, I finally confronted her. She always did it early in the morning, before we were even awake, but I set my alarm and was up and ready. When I got the notification on my phone, I immediately went outside to see her in a robe and carrying our flamingo. I startled her when I loudly said, Hey, what are you doing? She dropped him, thankfully it didn't break somehow, and smiled at me saying that she thought someone was moving it, so that she was moving it back. I told her that it was always at the front and that my camera shows her moving it. She then tried to go through the list of excuses. It, it looks better over here. It looks creepy and she can see it from her window, and she doesn't like it. And as she did this, she was opening her robe ever so slightly to expose her thighs or the top of her bra. This woman was old enough to be my mother, so... I really don't like to think that's what she was going for. I told her that regardless of what she thought, she had no right messing with our stuff, and that if it continued, I would be calling the cops to get her trespassed. She seemed to take the not-so-subtle hint and quickly walked away. I really thought that that was going to be the end of it, and that we were just going to have a cranky old neighbor, but I was so wrong. We didn't have many interactions with her, besides her now being hostile towards the both of us. Until people started mentioning break-ins in the neighborhood. However, the only one reporting them was Martha, and she never told anyone who the victims were. And then, one day as we were making dinner, someone knocked on our door. I went to answer it, and I was surprised to see two cops standing there. They asked to come in, and I of course let them in. I sat on the couch, as they explained the recent break-ins in the area. Then he mentioned that Martha was a recent victim. I was surprised. We heard and saw nothing, so I asked if she was okay. Sure, she was a pain, but I didn't wish any harm on her. One of the cops didn't have a very good poker face and looked at me suspiciously while the other one kept the same demeanor and asked me more about it. Until the questions started becoming more accusatory. He then broke it to me that Martha claimed 
that she saw me throw the rock in her window, which is why they were over here talking to me. I told them neither of us had anything to do with it, and that we had been home the whole time. I even told them about my cameras and showed them the footage. They looked over it, scrolled through the entire day, and they didn't see us leave the house once, or go over towards her place at all. I work from home and Jackie had the day off, so we had both been inside all day. Satisfied with what they saw, they said that they had no proof and only hearsay anyways, so they just wanted to ask questions. They apologized for the intrusion and left. I was beyond furious. She was now trying to, what, frame us? I was even starting to doubt all of the break-ins. Did she break her own window just to set this all up? Who would even do that? But just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, a few nights after that incident, Jackie and I were in the living room watching TV when there was a loud crashing sound, and our front bay window was smashed in, with a rock that was now sitting on our living room floor. Jackie ran to the kitchen and called the cops, while I approached the front door, now holding the only thing close to a weapon that I had, an umbrella. I walked outside and saw nothing. Maybe they didn't realize we were home and fled when they heard us scream. But with everything else that had occurred that week, I went back to check the window, and my worry quickly turned into anger. There, on my living room floor, was the small decorative rock that Martha had along the side of her house. I knew that it had to be from hers, because they were all painted. I immediately checked my camera, and wouldn't you know it, she walked into our yard carrying this rock, lowered her head, I guess to try and hide her face, and threw the rock through the window. I showed the police the footage when they arrived, and they pretty quickly went over and she was walked out in cuffs. After I calmed down that night, Jackie convinced me that the whole ordeal probably scared her enough, and that we probably shouldn't press charges. Instead, she had to pay to replace the window and apologize to us, and to be honest, that was pretty satisfying. We got the window replaced pretty quick, and to our surprise, we rarely saw Martha after that. If she was outside and we went out, even if it was just to get the mail or take out the trash, she quickly went back inside. She attended one of the block parties since then, but she steered clear from us. We became pretty good friends with a couple across the street, and they said they were surprised because she used to complain about them a lot, but seemed to stop out of nowhere. So, it appeared that we were not the only ones that she targeted. I still have no idea why, though. We actually lived there for a few more years until we finally moved, but Martha was still there. I just hope the new owners either get along with her, or, on the other end of that, are willing to stand up to her bullying. This story may seem a bit out there, but I have to get it off my chest. Last year, my family moved into this old house that my grandpa used to own. My grandpa rented it out to another family, and they had decided to move out of the state. And since my grandpa is entering the palliative years of his life, which I know sounds a bit morbid, but he does have cancer and there's not much that can be done for him. Anyways, since that's happening, my grandpa went ahead and made a deal with my dad that would allow us to own the house, and he decided that it would be our family home. So we moved in. And from day one, it was clear that something was off. At first it was just, oh yeah, this old house has some quirks, but it became something more pretty quickly. It started small enough. I would find stuff moved around my room and think that it was my little brother. My books that I kept on my desk would end up on my floor. My chair would be by my closet. 
I would always yell at Aiden about it, asking why he was going into my room. But then after a while, he started complaining about things moving in his room and things disappearing. And then I would find some of them in my closet. Again, at first, I thought he was doing this to mess with me. But he was seven. And while it would be a pretty good prank, it just didn't seem like him. My parents pretty much ignored our complaints, but it kept happening, so we kept telling them. Then, one Friday night, things got real. I was up late, everyone else was asleep, and I was sitting at my desk on my laptop, working on schoolwork. I know, super exciting way to spend a Friday night as a teenager. I jumped when I heard the sound that was like a creaking noise, like someone was walking on the stairs. I figured it was probably just one of my parents going down, but then it kind of clicked that in order for them to go down the stairs, they would have to have walked past my door, which they hadn't. My door was open. I poked my head out and the hallway was empty. As soon as I look out, the creaking noise just stops. I'm thinking, okay, that's weird, but whatever. Fast forward to a couple of days later, and I was much in the same position. It was later in the night, I was on my computer doing whatever, and out of the corner of my eye, I see someone walk into my room. I jumped and turned to look at whoever it was, but there was no one there. I stepped out of my room and looked down the hallway, and no one's there. I think maybe someone went downstairs, and whatever I saw was my mind tricking me into thinking they were coming into my room. So, I headed downstairs to see who it was. But again, there was nobody there. Then, when I turned to walk back up the stairs, the lamp in the corner of the room clicked on. This isn't a smart bulb or anything other than just an old lamp from a garage sale that sat on a corner table. In order for it to turn on, it had to be clicked on manually. I noped back up the stairs and shut my door, deciding I would just go to sleep. Then, my mom had an experience. It's important to note that my mom is a no-nonsense, skeptical person, and she was pretty annoyed with my brother and I telling her about the weirdness, to the point that she told us that it was a quote-unquote forbidden topic. Silly, yes but it was what it was. However, one morning, a few weeks after the lamp thing, I come downstairs in the morning and she's standing in the kitchen staring out the window, and she looks white as a ghost. No pun intended. I asked her what was wrong, and when I spoke, she nearly jumped out of her skin. Like, she was super deep in thought. At first, she tried to say nothing, but I pried a bit. She ended up telling me that she woke up in the middle of the night last night, and she swore that she saw someone standing in the room, at the foot of their bed. She said that she thought it was me, but after focusing on it, she could tell that it was masculine, and when she sat up in a panic, it just sort of faded away. My dad came down and made a joke about it, but I could see that my mom was seriously shook. After this... My mom actually went through a really tough period where she had insomnia, and couldn't sleep in her room. It actually caused a really rough patch in my parents' marriage. My mom would sleep in their room and would have these terrible nightmares, and swear that there was something hovering over the bed the whole time. My dad didn't see it, so of course he struggled with how to navigate it. For him, it was just a stressful situation where my mom would sleep on the couch downstairs because it was the only way that she could actually sleep. After a while, we were able to work the problem out, and I volunteered to swap rooms with them. I was willing to put up with it if it meant that they could be okay, and that my mom could get through the issues. What was weird? After we swapped rooms, it all seemed to stop. She stopped having nightmares, and stopped having insomnia. My brother and I stopped having things moved around, and I never saw any more moving shadows. I'm not saying what this all was, because it seemed like a weird haunting, 
But also, why would it just stop like that when we changed rooms? In the end, all I can say is that it was weird. And I cannot explain it. Take it as you will. I'm just happy that it seems to be over. These events started when I was a kid, but also as recent as two years ago. I grew up in a very small town. The neighborhood I lived in was the largest one in the area, and on top of the houses, we had one grocery store and one gas station. Yes, it was that small. But we did have a firehouse that had a pop machine in front of it, that a lot of us kids liked to go get a drink and hang out. The firemen there were always very nice to us kids and pretty much watched over us. There were another couple of people that cared for us kids too. And that was the Hendersons that lived close to the firehouse. We had to pass their home to get there. During spring and summer, we often saw them outside doing something in their yards. Miss Henderson, I think her first name was Diane, was usually cleaning up her garden beds near her windows. Mr. Henderson, or Gary, could be found riding around on his ancient-looking lawnmower or doing something on the side of the house, where his shed was. I liked to go over there a lot as a kid. Diane made the best butterscotch cookies and would send me home with some. Gary seemed to be a nature enthusiast. He would always point out berries and leaves that were safe to eat, gave tips on how to identify them, and even showed me how to make a strong rope out of dried vines. I loved learning so many things from him. But then I experienced death for the first time in my life. Mr. Henderson had passed away. The neighborhood felt a bit emptier and a bit quieter without his presence. But it seemed even more empty by the fact that Ms. Henderson seemed to become more reclusive and withdrawn. She was rarely out in her yard, and when I did see her, she was never smiling, and she never acknowledged me. She wouldn't look at me or wave. I remember asking my parents about it, and they explained how she was probably still hurting and then everyone coped with grief differently, but the best thing to do was to give her space. Gary was important to me, but I didn't understand death quite so well as an adult, and why she was so sad. But I took my parents' advice and stopped trying to get her attention when I passed by. But after a few months of much of the same, curiosity had gotten the best of me, and I felt sorry for her. So I made her a card in school during our free time, and I wanted to give it to her hoping that it might cheer her up. Once I got off the bus, I walked backwards towards her house and knocked on the door. No one answered. I looked through the window by the door and noticed the house looked quite messy. It was an unusual sight because when I had been over, their home was always spotless, reminding me very much of my own grandparents' house. After standing there for some time, I thought I would try the backyard, thinking maybe she was out back. I walked through the gate and called out for Miss Henderson. No answer. I walked towards her rose bushes when I saw something run past me, causing me to look over. What I saw scared me. It looked human. I didn't see fur, just pale skin. But they were also completely nude and running on all fours. When I looked over, they were just running behind the shed towards the back corner of the yard. I was pretty well freaked out being a young child, and not knowing what I saw, and probably a little embarrassed that this person was naked. I immediately ran back to the gate, still closing it, and I ran all the way home. Since my parents told me I should leave her be, I didn't tell them what I saw. I never did. I never tried to see Miss Henderson after that day. I found it hard to even look over at her home afraid that I would see that thing again. Over time, I never heard people 
including my parents, bring up the Hendersons ever again. It was like they just disappeared. Years later, my family moved out of that town and somewhere with more schooling options. And that was the summer before I would have started high school. Since we moved, I excelled in my high school, made some great friends, and really solidified what I wanted to do with my career. Honestly, the Hendersons in that town were in the past by now. But during a graduation party, a lot of us reminisced on our childhoods, and things that we missed or didn't quite understand. And that's when I remembered what I experienced after Gary's passing. It stayed in the back of my mind until the party came to an end. I wanted to see my old childhood home. I asked my girlfriend if she wanted to join me, and she excitedly agreed. So we drove to my neighborhood and stopped in front of our old home. Someone lived there at the time, as there were children's toys in the yard, and it had been painted a pale blue. It looked good and well taken care of. But then I was curious about the Hendersons' home. At the party, I only told my friends about them and the things they did. I told them about Gary's passing and not seeing Diane after that, but I didn't tell them about seeing someone in the backyard. We drove around the other side of the neighborhood where it bumped up against the dense trees. We parked on the side of the road next to an open field and walked through the trees. I wanted to get to the backyard. I don't know what compelled me to check out the yard instead of just the front of the house, like I did my own. We got to the woods, and I just looked over what I could see of the yards and the trees, reminiscing. Then, I heard my girlfriend gasp and grab my arm. I looked over to where her focus was, and saw something staring at us from a large pile of leaves, branches, and debris. It had to be human, but again, their skin was a pale blue or grayish color and really leathery. There was no fur or hair, and even their heads seemed to be in patches. They were completely nude again and walking on both hands and feet. They had been watching us, until we probably startled them, and they walked to the pile to hide from us. We were both startled, but something was pulling me towards it. I slowly approached the pile, much to my girlfriend's dismay. Then, this thing jumped out from it, letting out this weird growl, but I could almost make out words. It said something like, Get out! But it sounded warped, like someone who didn't quite know how to speak. They then took off in the other direction, and hid in some of the bushes. It was evening, the sun was setting, but there was still light, and this thing was out there for anyone to see. I was pretty shaken up, my girlfriend obviously terrified. So we ran back through the trees, got in my car, and drove directly to her place. Once we got there... We sat in my car in her driveway, and she asked me what the hell we had just seen. I told her I wasn't certain, but then explained to her what I saw as a kid. She looked at me like I had something growing off my face. She first asked me if I told anyone, and then understood my reasoning. What was I supposed to say? There was a naked old person walking around their backyard like a dog? Hell, I technically shouldn't have even been back there. And now, it could be considered trespassing, and I was an adult. I didn't know what to do. The fact that she saw it too, all these years later, and actually saw it first this time, confirmed that I was not imagining it. But the worst part was that part of me feared that this thing was Miss Henderson. She'd become reclusive and it was back there when I was a child. Could she have become feral for some reason? Did she lose Gary and then just snap? God, I didn't want to think about it, but could she have been involved with his death? If that was her, she had to be much older. 
they were close enough to my grandparents' age when I was a kid. And at the time of this event, I was 18. How would she be able, in her fragile body, to walk like that? And to walk that fast? Or do the things that we were witnessing? I talked to my parents about her, kind of, a couple of days later, saying that I was just thinking back on my childhood. I mentioned how she just kind of disappeared after Gary's death, and my parents basically confirmed that. They said they didn't have any kids, and they assumed that a lot of their family either lived far away, or had also passed because they rarely saw anyone over there. They also said that she had pretty much disappeared. Her immediate neighbor asked around and asked for a welfare check, but when the police went in, she was nowhere to be found. But the house was spotless, with no signs of foul play. Because of this, they didn't really do any further investigation. They claimed that she probably left, or moved in with a relative, and her house sat as it was. I don't know how it ended up being sold. I finally told my parents about what I had seen, both times, and while my dad didn't say much, my mom said that she probably had dementia when I saw her as a kid, but thinks that we may have been mistaking a sick dog or something. I dropped it, as there really was no point in arguing, but I know what I saw. It was the same thing from my childhood. So now, I still think about it today, about what happened to Miss Henderson. Is it possible for someone to snap and become feral like that? What else could explain it? Could it really even be her? Or was it some other unknown creature that I saw? Sometimes I want to go back and see if I can stop it, but I can't bring myself to. I don't want to remember her like that, if that is her. And I don't want to make her into a spectacle for others. I'm really just hoping that I saw some weird creature, and not my sweet old neighbor lady. While I was a nurse training too many years ago, I worked nights in a care home that was really nice, and everyone was well taken care of. I usually worked alone along with a staff member asleep on the top floor in case of emergencies. On this night, there was two of us because a lady called Hilda was dying, and I was inexperienced. Hilda was on a lot of medication, and sometimes awake and quiet, other times sleeping. The doctor guessed that she had a few days left. She was a religious lady, so one of us staff would be sat with her reading the Bible to her, as requested. I hadn't gotten very far when Hilda said, Brian's here. Brian was her oldest son. Her family were great, regular visitors, so we knew them all well. I assumed that she meant he had visited that day. I explained that it was nighttime and he would likely be back in the morning, and she said, No, I can see him, silly. She smiled and held out her hand. I truly thought that she was hallucinating or something. So, I held her hand and carried on reading aloud. Not long later, around 11pm, she started to breathe differently and seemed to be unconscious. Her pulse began to slow. I left to fetch my coworker. I was gone for two, maybe three minutes tops, and when we returned, Hilda had died. I hated that I left her. I honestly thought that I had enough time. My coworker rang her daughter with the bad news, and she came out straight to the home. Her daughter stayed with Hilda to say goodbye while we managed to get through to a GP to come out to record the time of death. The daughter then asked me if her mom had been in any pain at the end. I said no, but explained that she had been dreaming about your brother Brian. I said that she thought he was here and had reached out for him. The daughter explained that Brian had actually died of a stroke just three days before, 
and that the rest of the family chose not to tell Hilda because they assumed the shock would kill her. She cried. I cried. I think I cried all night. I truly believed that Hilda's son had come to fetch her. It changed my views completely, and I saw the same thing many times throughout the years. A person's last words would often be to say that a loved one we knew was dead had come for them. If that happened, we came to understand that death wasn't far away. Story 2 Barbara was suffering from severe dementia. She was only in her early 60s, and the terrible disease had all but destroyed her. During tests, an inoperable tumor had also been discovered, and Barbara was considered terminal. She had been a loving and wonderful woman by all accounts. She didn't speak much, just the odd sentence, but nothing coherent. Still, we all thought the world of her. Due to the hospital being over capacity, she was given a private room on the ward that I worked in, a psychiatric ward, while she waited for hospice care. When her family wasn't with her, we were, or if we were too busy, we would set up a radio so she had something to listen to. Barbara was on heavy painkillers, and showed no outward signs of being in pain. Another nurse was sitting with her, reading a magazine, when the radio started to play a hissing static. As she got up to tune it, she heard the word, Help, come through loud and clear. She freaked out and ran. A care assistant replaced her, the same thing happened. She heard the words, Help, pain. Our ward sister at the time was a fierce older woman who could not be rattled. She terrified me. She went in next and also heard the word pain. I missed all this because I was busy, but I was present for the next part. A doctor was called down to assess if Barbara was in any pain at all. He said that it appeared not, until we told him about the radio. There's more things in heaven and earth, he said, all dramatically, and then organized stronger medication for her. After that, the radio continued working just fine. Barbara was moved a day later and passed peacefully. We scrapped the radio. I often wondered if Barbara had managed to communicate her pain to us, or if it was some wild coincidence. Her brain didn't work as it should, but it all got us thinking more about the possibility of consciousness existing separately to our body. This was before the days of mobile phones, too, and no one had a walkie-talkie or anything that might have interfered. Story 3 Doug, a lovely salt-of-the-earth type of man, almost stood on a mine in World War II. If not for a disembodied booming voice that yelled stop right down his ear. He held up his whole group thinking that someone had shouted at him. As a precaution, the group turned back and chose a different route. It was later discovered that the field they were previously in was riddled with mines. He swore that he had a guardian angel that looked after him and made sure he returned home to his new, pregnant wife. And story four. This is a very odd story, and I wondered if I should add it. Perhaps it'll make perfect sense to someone. Eric ended up in the British Navy. During training, him and his fellow new recruits had to run three miles, collect a particular ticket from a waiting bowl set up, and run back. Eric set off and decided that he couldn't be bothered to run. He managed to persuade a friend to grab him a ticket and run back to where he chose to wait, so he could pretend he'd completed the training. All went smoothly until the officer in charge noticed that Eric did not seem exhausted or sweaty at all. Of course, the man was watching the route and the runners, and they knew that Eric had cheated. They made him run the course alone, and then made him do it again. On the second time around, he stopped in a bit of woodland, threw up and lay on his back looking at the sky, completely fed up. He wondered what on earth he was doing, joining the navy, and he hoped the war might end before he found himself on a ship. 
minutes later, he saw a trio of German bombers flying over him in a triangle formation. After swearing and panicking, he ran back to help, assuming his barracks was under attack, but there was nothing wrong. No bombers, no sirens, no bombs. Everyone was fine, and nobody had seen the planes at all. He was teased about it, but it bothered him and made him extremely nervous. He was sure of what he had seen. The day after he left that base to ship out, a trio of bombers flew overhead and destroyed the barracks. I asked him if he thought he'd had a premonition, or experienced a time slip, but he didn't believe in anything like that and had no real explanation or ideas. He said that it happened, and that's that. I'll try to add more stories in a couple of days. I'm so happy that these tales are being read, enjoyed, and remembered. I knew I collected them and remembered them for a reason. I want to share what happened to me this summer, and I'm not sure where exactly to share it besides here, since I don't really know how to explain what I heard or felt. I started working on a cruise ship in Hawaii in February of 2023. I had a six-month contract to fulfill, with an end date in the beginning of August. The ship sailed around all of the islands with the same itinerary every week and the ship would dock overnight on the islands of Maui and Kaui every week. My two favorite islands, especially Kaui. I had a week left in my contract, and I planned on staying a week in Maui when the contract ended. I had saved up a ton of money, and wanted to make time to really enjoy the islands instead of seeing them from the crew deck. After nearly six straight months of working seven days a week on a busy cruise ship, with lots of rude passengers, I was pretty over it. But I was determined to finish my contract no matter what. We were docked in Maui, and were scheduled to set sail around 5.30pm. At the time, I worked 7am to 7pm at the bar on the pool deck with a break at 11am. I woke up that day and had a strange feeling. I felt like I needed to get off the ship. It wasn't just an I-don't-want-to-go-to-work feeling. I don't know how to describe it. I got dressed and went to my shift, but the feeling kept getting more intense. I left for my break and went back to my room to try to get a nap in, but when I got to my room, a voice in my head, I mean, a full voice, not a feeling, calmly but sternly said, Pack up, leave now. Get off the ship, pack up, leave now and get off the ship. It wasn't necessarily threatening, nor did it feel spooked or in danger. It made me feel excited and full of energy, and I actually started packing everything I had. I was going to jump ship, something I never thought I would do, as I always finish things that I start. I thought it was so dumb to not stick out the final week of work, but... I felt so compelled to listen to this voice. I said goodbye to my friends on the ship, who were all shocked, since I never once hinted that I wanted to quit, and they tried to stop me, but I continued on. I spent the next week staying in beautiful hotels and resorts in and surrounding Lahaina. I spent time eating great food, meeting great people, and just generally taking advantage of everything the island had to offer that I could never do because I was too busy on the ship. I fell in love with Lahaina. The old buildings, the history, the feel of it all. At some times, the tourists were a little overwhelming. Of course, I say this as a tourist there myself. But it was just beautiful. One of my Uber drivers told me to go to the banyan tree before I leave for home and put my hand on it to feel its energy and thank it. So I did. I placed my hand and head on its trunk, and it's like this energy just turned on inside of my body. I couldn't hear the sounds of the crowds of tourists around me. I couldn't hear anything, actually. All I could feel was this connection that I never felt before. I can't describe what I felt, but something in that tree reassured me that I did the right thing. 
Then it told me it was time to go. Two days later, and I'm back on the east coast of the mainland, catching up with friends and family who I missed so much, when an alert from one of my news apps pops up on my phone. Maui was on fire. Specifically, Lahaina was on fire. I opened the app and saw pictures and videos of the courthouse, the banyan tree, the restaurants where I ate, the hotels where I stayed, all transformed to rubble. I couldn't freaking believe it. All I could think of were all the people that I shared that week with, all the people who showed me the best time of my life, and how they may not be on this earth anymore. I thought about the bartenders who served me, the shop owners who sold me their goods, the fishermen who caught the food that I ate. They could all be gone. It wasn't until one of my ship friends texted me asking if I was alive until it hit me. I was supposed to be there. I was supposed to end my contract two days prior and stay in Maui. I turned off the news and just broke down crying. I still cry sometimes thinking about it. I've never heard that voice in my head before and I haven't heard it since. But whatever it was, thank you for saving me. I don't know what purpose I have on this earth, but I'm grateful that I still have a chance to figure it out. Thank you all for taking the time to read this and sharing your own stories. Listening to everyone's experiences has helped me process this whole thing. I don't feel crazy anymore and I know that I'm not the only one who's heard it, or something like it. Also, I'm glad that you're all still here. We all have a purpose. And... I think that's cool as hell. When I was 28, I was looking for a new place to live. I wasn't too happy with the apartment I was in anymore, and I wanted to find something with a bit more room, but still a reasonable price. I was paying too much for a one-bedroom apartment. So, when I found a duplex with two bedrooms and a full basement for nearly the same price, I was pretty thrilled. It was in a nicer neighborhood, and was pretty close to my work, which was a real winner for me. I moved in quickly and settled in even faster. I'd like to think that I'm a pretty outgoing person, so I became curious when I hadn't seen my neighbor once while I was moving in. Until one day, I saw a middle-aged woman leaving the other duplex. She was in a suit skirt with a jacket. Obviously dressed for a nice office job, so I assumed she was probably just really busy and kept to herself. But the times that I started noticing her were pretty sporadic. It was only maybe two or three times a week, and sometimes I would see her arriving and other times leaving. One of those times, I was just coming home myself, as she was leaving. We made eye contact, so I stopped to say hi, and to introduce myself. She was very nice, and she told me her name was Teresa, but she actually didn't live there. Her 80-year-old dad, Carol, did. She said she came to visit him a few times a week, she would get his groceries, take him to doctor's appointments, things like that. She also mentioned that he didn't get out much, so I probably wouldn't see him much, but that he would probably talk my ear off if I did see him. After talking for a little bit, she left and I went about my business. From then, I would occasionally see him when he got his mail, or left with Teresa to go wherever. When we were outside at the same time, he would talk to me about pretty much anything on his mind, he was definitely a kind old man, and the fact that he pretty much kept to himself it made me think he was going to continue to be a pretty great neighbor. And this was a few months into me living there at this point. I came home from work and saw Carol sitting out in the chair on his side of the patio in just his cargo shorts. He had a magazine that was rolled up, and he appeared to be swatting the air in an annoying manner. I approached him, and his face softened, and he jokingly said, Oh, how was work, dear? That was just who he was, and I didn't mind. 
We talked for a moment when he brought up how much he hated mosquitoes. I suggested bug spray and the little citronella candles. As we talked, I mentioned how I used to have the tiki torches on my apartment balcony, so I could sit out there and not be bothered. He thanked me, and said that he would remind Teresa to pick some up when she went shopping for him next, and then we said goodbye. A few days later, I saw him outside again and watched from my window as this man sprayed himself all over with the bug spray. He sprayed his legs, his arms, his torso, and even above him like he was misting himself. It definitely looked strange to me, but then I thought maybe there was something about the bugs, like a phobia, or maybe he had a fear of being bitten. Or maybe they were just really that much of an annoyance to him. It really wasn't my place to judge, so I left it alone as life continued on as normal. But it was the following night that I sat in my living room, eating my dinner, when I started smelling something funny. It was a strong chemical smell, but I couldn't quite tell what it was. I was worried that something may have caught on fire and started walking around my unit. My cat had been sitting next to me, so I knew that she didn't get into anything. I checked all the sockets, anything electrical that I could think of, including the heat lamp on my iguana's cage, but everything seemed fine. But the smell still worried me. Was it in my head? Was there something wrong with me by chance? I decided to walk out front to get some fresh air and see if maybe I could still smell it out there. The answer was yes, I could definitely smell it, but I had also figured out what the source of the smell was. It was Carol, once again spraying himself with the same bug spray, and I could now place that scent. We immediately started talking because he heard me open my door, of course. He claimed the bugs were getting worse, and were now getting inside his home. He talked about how he couldn't stand it, so he sprayed all the vents the doorways, even his air filter. He doused it with the stuff. I tried to get a better explanation at that point, wondering if he was still talking about mosquitoes or something else. All he could tell me was that they were bugs and that they were everywhere. I told him to be careful with the spray, trying not to sound mean and said that it could be harmful to ingest and that maybe we should contact the rental office so that they can treat for them instead. He said that was probably a good idea, and I went back inside, opening some windows to air out my side of the place. I made a mental note to myself to let Teresa know the next time I saw her to do the same, and to not buy him more bug spray. I was able to let her know, but she said that she had only bought him the one can, and assumed that he probably ordered more online, as he did do that sometimes. Again, it wasn't my place to tell her what to do, but the amount that he was using was almost disturbing, and to practically drench yourself in it was not good either. I saw my share of mosquitoes out there, but he made it seem like there was a swarm of them all over him at all times, and I can assure you that that was not happening. I just told her what I saw and that I was concerned with him spraying it so much, and she said that she would talk to him about it, and that was that. Unfortunately, the bug spray wasn't even the worst of it. While I was in bed, going in and out of sleep, I had become pretty hot, and was almost irritable with how hot it was. I sat up in bed wondering if there was something wrong with the AC, and no sooner than when I got out of bed the smoke alarm started going off. I panicked and ran out of my room to see flames from the living room window and tons of dark smoke coming in from the vents. I grabbed my cat and my iguana, scaring them both, I'm sure, and ran through the back door, running to the front yard. I had a button latch on my hatchback, so I was able to open it and put them both in there. Thankfully, they both get along, too. I had to put them up before I actually approached the cause of the flames, because it was coming from Carol. 
He was holding one of those tiki torches against the wall, and was watching it as it slowly caught fire. I screamed at him, What the hell are you doing? But when he turned around, that was a face I had never seen before. He looked so angry and his eyes were so wide. They looked like they were going to pop out. He said that he finally figured out a way to get rid of the damn bugs. He said that he made a fire on all of his vents, which also meant that our shared wall was on fire, and was now torching the outside. I was so afraid to approach him, being a small woman, but I did, and he surprisingly handed the torch over to me. But he continued to talk about what he had done, like it was some hobby or other harmless project that he was working on. I had my phone on me, and I had grabbed it as I was rounding up the pets, so I finally called 911 once I had my bearings. And the whole time, Carol was just continuing to talk in the background. The firemen arrived quickly and put out the fire, and we both talked to the police about what had happened. Thankfully, Carol did have Teresa's number memorized, so we called her and she was there pretty fast too. It was the only time that I ever saw her not dressed up. That was an awful moment right there, and I think it really opened Teresa's eyes about what was happening. What did you do, Dad? She was pleading with him as he continued to talk about the bugs. It was terrifying, but I also felt so bad about the whole thing. I felt like it was my fault. I shouldn't have brought up the spray or the torches or any of it. Once the smoke cleared, literally, they were able to go inside to assess the damage. Most of it was on our shared wall, and the outside wall of course, and there were some burn spots on the carpet on Carol's side. I had to move a lot of stuff out of my living room so that they could come in and repair it, but otherwise it was still a good sturdy building. I didn't see Carol much after that. Teresa had come by and got some of his stuff, but she told me that he was going to be living with her for the time being, and said that she should have done that a lot sooner, joking that she would have saved gas anyways. I wished her well, and once all of his stuff was out, that was the last that I saw of them. After some repairs on the other side, I finally got some new neighbors. It was a younger lady with a baby, and so far they haven't been too bad. I still live there, so Carol lives rent-free in my mind. Sometimes I will randomly smell something funny, or I'll hear the neighbor's smoke alarm go off, and it sets me into a panic. We've talked plenty of times, and she's mentioned how it goes off when she's cooking, so I know everything is okay, but my heart rate still jumps a bit when it happens. I do hope that Carol is doing better now, but since the fire was so close to home, it has kind of become a pretty big fear of mine. I have a fairly short story about this one pretty creepy experience that happened to me a while back. I don't remember when exactly it was, but it was in 2022. That much I know. I think it was early spring, so probably March. It's not really relevant to the story, though, so I won't dwell on that too much. I remember that I was having a bit of a strange day. It was one of those days where nothing felt right, and everything seemed to go wrong, but I didn't know why. It was late, and I decided to randomly try out this little diner that was in town. It was a neat little place. It had an old-school vibe to it, with the retro neon signs inside on the walls, and bright red tables. It had that vibe that I really dug, and they were playing old jazzy music, so I really just wanted to chill out for a bit after a long day and enjoy my time to myself. As I was walking toward the door, this random dude pretty much popped up out of nowhere. Like, I didn't see him outside the building at all as I was approaching, and I really don't know where he was hiding. 
I jumped when he approached me and he apologized, seeming sincere in his apology. We both kind of chuckled, and in between him saying sorry, he started talking to me about some charity things. I really didn't mean to scare you, miss. I'm sorry. I just wanted to talk to you really quickly about a cause that we're trying to raise money for. I'm with the local church, and we're trying to get some money together for our youth group so they can take a trip. We're wanting to get up to South Dakota so they can see Rushmore and the Crazy Horse Memorial, and, and just enjoy the beauty that is the Dakotas. At first, I was quick to brush him off, but when he mentioned the youth group and wanting to go see Rushmore, it got my attention. I was raised in Fargo, so I loved the Dakotas. As he was giving his speech, however, another guy walked up behind him. Big guy. Very bouncer-like. And while he was intimidating, he was also holding a clipboard, so I just assumed that he was also with the church. He finished his whole speech, and I then asked how I could help out. He lit up and mentioned that they could take cash or a check, or they could give me a card for their website to send money over PayPal. I should have walked away, but I figured that I had ten bucks to spare, so I grabbed my wallet, pulled out a ten, and then handed it to him. And then the second man started to speak up. If you could, also, please put your name on this list, with your phone number, and the amount that you're donating. It's for tax purposes, and we have to fill this out to show that it was a donation, and that you're a real person. That sounded legit, so... I grabbed the clipboard and started to put down my information, and stopped where it said address. I asked if I needed to write down my address, and the bigger guy smirked and said, Oh, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I want you to. I looked up at him for a moment, because he wanted me to? He caught on and immediately shrunk, saying, I mean, they ask for it, but it's not necessary. Just your phone number. I put in the info, not adding my address, handed him the cash and the clipboard. The first guy then thanked me. I said no problem and started heading back towards the door to the restaurant. The two men started to walk away, but when I glanced back at them, the bigger guy was very clearly staring at me. Like, perv staring. I swear that he was drooling, and that's not to say that I'm attractive. He was just perving out. I shook it off and walked in, grabbed a booth off to the side near the back, and I asked for some coffee. As soon as I got my coffee, my phone screen lit up with a call from an unknown number. I stared at its like, what car warranty scammer is going to be calling me at 10 o'clock at night? And I answered it. When I said hello, I could hear someone on the other end breathing, like they were walking quickly. I said hello again, and then it got freaky. I could hear myself on the other end, like I was in the background. I immediately turned around, and much to my surprise, the bigger guy was standing right behind me. He quickly took a step forward and sat across from me in my booth, just staring at me, with this creepy cheesy grin, and then said something that I seriously didn't expect. Hey, I wanted to keep this going. I saw the way you looked at me when you were walking away, and I know you saw me looking at you. I think that we should get to know each other better. I just stared at him for a moment. It was a bold move, and he had quite the gall to come in here and just join me uninvited and taking my phone number from their list to call me like that, though, thinking back, that may have been a bit of a power move to show that he had my information. Good thing I didn't put my address, huh? I then told him, in no uncertain terms, that I had a boyfriend, though I didn't at that time, and that I was not interested. Then, he dropped a bomb on me. That's okay. I'm not really here to give you an option. I think you just need to go ahead and get up and come with me. I know that my non-verbals were showing as I gave him an ugly sneer like, You're choking, right? He just gave me this really creepy smile. This really 
really terrifying grin and said, Get up, come with me, and I won't have to hurt you. At this point, I thought it was over. I was about to get abducted, and my options were to scream and cause a scene and risk this turning into a bigger thing than it was, which was absolutely the direction I was going, despite not knowing what he was planning or capable of, or go with him. Thankfully, I didn't have to do either. I was about to start yelling that he needed to leave, when the waitress that had taken my order came over and very loudly said, Oh my goodness, girl, I haven't seen you in such a long time. I jumped and looked over at her. The man in the booth with me did the same. She continued, We were all talking about you the other day, talking about how it's been so quiet since you left us. Uh, Bob, the manager, was just talking about how much he missed you this morning. He's in the back. Come on, I know he wants to see you. Come with me. She immediately put her arm around my shoulder and pulled me out of the booth, just keeping her eyes on mine the entire time she pulled me away from the booth. I will say that I was obviously very confused, and still rather jumpy, but she took me to the back and into the little office where the manager was sitting. When she got me to the office, the manager stood up and asked me if I was okay. I nodded and asked what was going on. He mentioned that he'd been watching the guys out front all night, and that he had a bad feeling about them because they had only been approaching women, and seemingly only women, at the door pretty much all night. When he confronted them earlier, they told him what it was for. They showed him credentials and proof for the fundraiser, but he still thought that it was a bit weird that they were collecting money so late at night. He told them that they could do what they did, but if a single person complained, they would be immediately asked to leave. Then, when I went through, he said that he saw the second guy, the bigger guy that followed me into the diner, watching off to the side before he walked up. Then, when I entered the diner, the first guy seemed ready to head off, but the second guy sort of waved him away, and then slowly followed me into the diner. But then just sort of lingered near the door, watching me. And then, when he walked up and sat in the booth, he said that my face went completely pale, and he knew right then that there was an issue. He was talking with my waitress, asking if I'd mentioned the guy joining me, and when she said no, that I was alone, he worked out that she'd go out and pretend that I was a former employee to get me back here. He then mentioned that the police had already been called, and asked that I waited in the back while they sorted it out. I did. I sat back there with the waitress, stressing out, probably crying the whole time. She was hugging me, telling me that I was safe. When the cops showed up, the guy had left, obviously, but they asked me some questions about what he'd said, what they approached me about out front, and so on. I told them what he'd said in the booth, how he had basically threatened me, saying that I was going to go with him. They got the camera footage from the diner of the guy and the vehicle that he'd come in, and they also got information about the church the guys worked for. After the cops left, the manager asked me if I could call someone to make sure that I made it home safely, because he didn't want me leaving alone just in case. I called my brother, and I told him about the whole situation, and he immediately came to follow me home. I cannot express how thankful I am for that manager, and that he was attentive and that the waitress was good at acting, because she was super convincing. He could have looked the other way and thought, that's none of my business. He could have just ignored the whole thing, but because he was attentive and intuitive, he knew something was going on, and he made sure that nothing happened to me. I did make it home fine, and I never saw those guys again, and I have no idea if the cops were able to do anything about it. I also ended up making that diner a regular hangout spot for me, though I made sure to never go alone after that night.
I recently listened to one of your older videos about cryptids, and I felt compelled to share an experience that my friends and I had when we went camping. This took place back in 2017. Four of my friends and I went camping in a spot up in the mountains. It was one of our favorite places because it was so secluded and away from people, away from the city and all the lights that it brought. I loved seeing the stars at night between the tall trees. No topper, no tent, just the bed, my sleeping bag, and that's it. We planned on being up there for a few days. The day we arrived, we set up and had a great night, but the following evening, the atmosphere seemed to shift. The air became really still, but it was different from the stillness before a storm. It was hard to explain. Even the wildlife seemed to stop existing. My friend feared that there may have been a mountain lion in the area and wanted to pack it in. Unfortunately, the rest of us weren't ready to call it quits. I gave her the keys to stay in my truck and joked that we could get away if she was right. Everyone else settled in for the night and slept in the bed of my truck again. But while I laid there trying to sleep, I couldn't shake that feeling that I was being watched. I would look into my truck to see Janet passed out. I looked over to all the tents, and my friends were nowhere to be seen, so they must have been in their tents. I scanned the trees in the area and didn't see anything or anyone. I finally told myself that I must have gotten myself worked up because of the air and my friend being worried. So I just told myself to calm down and finally fell asleep. The next morning seemed to be back to normal, so we all chalked it up to something being in the area. We were intruding on their habitat, so it was possible. But we continued to have a great day. It was once again the following night when things got a bit... scary. We'd been sitting around the fire, talking and having a good time when once again the air seemed to become still. No crickets chirping, no owl hoots, there was nothing. Nothing except a pretty pungent smell. And that's when we noticed how still and quiet it was. We sat there in silence, looking around, trying to see if we could find the source of the smell or why the forest went silent. When my friend pointed out something in the trees in the distance... He said that he saw a tall figure dart across them. Jake, being who he was, wanted to go check it out. I can't blame him, as I'm the same way. But I'm a small girl, so I probably wouldn't have gone if I was alone. The other three stayed by the fire while Jake and I approached the trees. We didn't go far. There was a path that separated our campgrounds from the trees on the other side, but as we crossed the path, we started hearing a low guttural growl. It stopped us from going forward, not wanting to be mauled by whatever it was. We still wanted to know what it was. Did we stand a chance, or would we be better off moving or leaving? So we started shining our flashlights through the trees to find the culprit. And to this day, I wish we would have just ignored it or packed up and left. We spotted something rocking side to side between the trees. It stood about six feet tall and stood hunched over. Its skin, if you could call it that, was a shade of gray tightly clinging to the bones. It had small tufts of hair and random spots all over. Altogether, it just looked beyond emaciated. But the more we looked at it, the more we couldn't look away. The growling was definitely coming from whatever this thing was, but where its face should have been, it wasn't. I was following the shape of the creature with my flashlight, but I could not find eyes or a mouth anywhere on what I assumed to be its head. It made no sense. While we continued to take in the sight of this thing, it raised one arm, or leg, whatever it was, as it twitched and let out another loud growl. Except that time, it sounded like someone trying to scream with their mouth covered. Whatever it was, it was not human, but 
I couldn't identify it either. All I knew was the sheer terror it instilled in me, and I yanked on Jake's arm to get the hell out of there. Thankfully, he didn't resist, and we went back to the camp where the rest of them asked what the hell that was, and were freaking out as well. I was right there with them. None of us felt comfortable staying there, so we haphazardly broke down our tents and threw everything in my truck or Caleb's. We drove back down to the entrance, and with us all being too tired and scared, we slept in the trucks in the parking lot when we could finally fall asleep. The next morning, we decided to check out the area before we left, feeling a little safer in the daylight. When we got up there, our campground looked picked over. The food items we left behind were shredded and eaten. The ground had been scratched at, as you can see the wide rake marks through the gravel as well as spots that looked to be dug out in dirt. You could see the large individual marks like it was done with a rake or large claws. We cautiously approached the spot where we saw the creature that night. There was a small pile of something by the tree. I say something because it looked like something that was regurgitated, that included a small carcass in it. I couldn't stay long as it was making me sick, so I had to walk away. We went and told one of the rangers about a possibly sick animal up there that was potentially hostile, but he didn't seem to care much. He said that he would look into it and that was it. Given his demeanor, I didn't think that he would care about our description of the creature, or even believe us, so we just left it at that. We didn't camp there again until the next year, in spring instead of the summer. I was hoping that either the thing we saw was either dead, or maybe a different season would cause it to not be around. Thankfully, whatever the case was, we didn't see it. Part of me wishes that I would so I could try to get pictures, but part of me also thinks we got lucky getting out of there in one piece. I need to tell you some of my background to understand who some of these people are. I, 28, female, moved into my partner, 29, males, house when we got engaged. We'd been together for two years and we wanted to progress with our relationship further. We're happy, good communication, and mutually shared goals. The only person I have friction with in this scenario is his young sister, 21 female who, I guess, doesn't like me. She doesn't like how I come from a working-class background, and thinks that I'm a gold digger who married up. No matter what I've done, it's never enough for her, and she has tried to sabotage our relationship before, even going as far as to make fake screenshots to lie that I was cheating with my partner. We had a small celebration at the new house together, and invited some close family and friends. It was a lovely night. The next day, we met the neighbors, and they seemed nice enough. I came back home from work and saw his sister was there, the last person I wanted to see, but I was friendly. She had this smug smile that made me suspicious. She left, and my partner and I were pleased. He's always been good at sticking up for me, but they are close, and she is his baby sister, so he wants me to at least try to make an effort. Now, I know all that was long, but I needed to explain it. I had a neighbor, male, 52, start knocking on the door and come over to chat with us frequently. He was friendly, retired, and I thought that he just wanted to get to know us. My partner and he developed a friendship. However, the neighbor would come over frequently and start speaking to me too. I'd humor him, and then politely tell him that I was going to call my family or some other excuse. He then started dropping some more sexualized compliments, that my pants showed off my figure, that he would love to quote-unquote join us sometime. I told him that we just weren't into that, and he told me that I didn't need to be shy, and that he knew that we were swingers. 
Now, I don't care what someone does with other consenting adults. However, that really just is not my thing. I then asked him to leave. Now. He waited a moment, but then did finally leave. I wish I had asked him at this point where he got this idea. Instantly, I picked up my phone and called my partner to tell him what happened. He told me that he hadn't said anything to give him that impression either. Either way, he was supportive. The next part is when my partner and I were having an intimate moment together. I won't go into details, but basically I don't know when it started. We were having a break when I noticed a figure in the window. I screamed and my partner came out of the bathroom to ask what was wrong. I told him that I thought I saw someone outside the window. By the time he went outside to investigate, all he found were the plants were crushed. The person had left, and fortunately, we did have security cameras around the property. We looked to see the neighbor sneak through the garden, sit in the garden bed, and look through all while... Well, how do I put this politely? Fondling himself? Jerkin the gherkin, wrestling the one-eyed trouser snake, I think you get the picture. I instantly felt sick. We didn't see him for a week or two. My partner's sister then came over again, and I had to smile through it. She seemed shocked when she found out what had happened, and laughed about how weird it was. I still didn't put my finger on it at that time. From then on, we made sure the blinds were closed. The next time we saw him, my partner told him that we had him on camera watching us. The neighbor then told us that he thought we were into this, and we both shouted no at the same time. He told us that we enjoyed being watched during the act. My partner demanded to know where the hell he came up with this idea. He then said that my partner's sister had told him that we were swingers, and always on the look for more playmates me especially, and that it wouldn't be the first time that I cheated on my fiancé. My partner told him that we were not like that. The neighbor did accept this. He would still look when we walked by, but he kept his distance after that. We then invited his sister over to speak to her to see if it was true. I was furious, and I believed it even without speaking to her. My partner asked if she knew anything about it, and kept insisting. After an hour of conversation, she finally cracked and admitted that she did it. And then she laughed, and wouldn't apologize. When he asked her why, she told him that it was for him to break up with me so that he wouldn't have to deal with me anymore. This all happened four years ago, and we still haven't spoken to his sister since then. I had the dream that felt like a real movie, like life, <laughs> but another life. I always dream about the same place, so that's what I'm going to explain first. The high mountains of rock and sand, and it's desert-like, but with water. And some areas have low copper red and whitish brown color rock valleys, with giant pools of water inside craters, where highly intelligent sea creatures live. Other areas have soft, sandy mountains that people like to sit on and watch the ocean or run down to surf or swim. It's not very sunny, so moss grows on the sand. The sun hits just right. Being there feels good, and I have no idea why. I have nothing against people who do, but I have never taken hallucinogens. These are just dreams. This time I was on the mountain trying to walk with my sister and some old guy teaching her how to fish. But I couldn't keep up with them, since the old man turned around and gave me a suspicious, grinning stare. It was as if my legs were disobeying the rest of my body, going the other way, downwards. My father appeared and tried to help me go down safely, but he slipped and fearlessly slid onto something I saw earlier inside the bottom of the mountain. I told him to be careful because people said it was a doorway to another planet. 
we realized he fell onto a round glass screen, or window, about 1.5 meters in diameter, and around it was the mountain sand that grew even more moss around it. But it was a dry substance of green moss. From afar, it would probably look like the eye of the mountain. He looked into it and was shocked. I knew that I had to give up fighting against my legs and go there as well. So I tried to go down carefully, but nothing I could grab onto helped. I knew I had to fall from the sky, which makes me think that it was an unknown force that kicked me into the sky, because I was outside of my body when I saw how I was pushed forward and fell down. Like that fear we get when we fall in a dream. Finally, I could look into the glass, but only for a few seconds. And I panicked. Because it was a two or three year old boy inside, almost fully submerged in water, and he was stuck in a cage, crying, not knowing what to do. He was light skinned with orange hair and a mohawk style, and had primitive clothes on black animal fur and straps around his arms and legs. The glass was as thick as half of my arm. We had no way of saving him, but we tried to find a way. And then, whoosh. It was as if the glass showed me an image inside my head, of the many people walking in a random town, and it asked me if I wanted to go inside to help the kid. And as I looked at what the other people were wearing, I recognized their clothes and said yes. It looked familiar enough. And suddenly, I was there, but not in body form. I just was. I realized the people in red suits were light brown, like Palestinian, wearing the red English palace suits that I know of, and the others were wearing blue suits, and I realized that I was in another world. The last thing I remember was being with a group of children, they were brothers and sisters, and the only face I remember is a little four-year-old white boy with white hair, extremely confident and talkative like the rest of them, and all of them were independent, doing everything for themselves and each other in total harmony, even though they had tremendous differences. I didn't see the parents, but they lived in a good house with everything they needed. The carpets were brown, and they had white wooden staircase right in front of the front door leading to the left, where the rooms were. I remember them going to school with their things. One of the things I noted was something I would have seen in the 90s, but I can't quite remember what. And that's when I woke up. Now... I want to preface this story by stating that I'm a very analytical person. I'm a technical business analyst, for God's sake, so my livelihood is to analyze and find reasoning behind every situation. But it's to the point where I can't deny that something is living in my family home, and it imitates my mom. I live in Queensland, Australia. In about 2004, we moved into a very old Queenslander home. Google Queenslander home and you'll see the type of house I'm talking about. It was a big fixer-upper, with very high ceilings, and a beautiful deck that caught the summer breeze perfectly. It was the first house built in the entire street over 150 years ago, and used to be a celery farm. Random, I know. About 15 years ago, my cousin was sleeping over one night, we were very close, and she told me all about her paranormal experiences. For context, she grew up in Indonesia and her mother was apparently into black magic, so she has seen and experienced a lot of the paranormal. Is there anything in my house? I asked her. Yes, she replied. She sits on the windowsill of your mom's room. Is it bad? I asked, not too sure if I actually wanted to hear the answer. Just don't bother it, she said, shutting down the conversation. Fast forward a few years, I was sitting on my bed studying with the door open. I then see my mum walk down the hallway with the washing baskets, about to put on a load of laundry. 
About five seconds later, I see her walk down the hallway with the washing baskets, going the same direction she was before. I was baffled. How could she walk the same direction twice? I tried to shake it off, thinking it was just my tired mind playing tricks on me. After all, I was studying and it was late. About a year passes, and I had forgotten the spooky incident of my mum walking in the same direction twice. It was a Friday afternoon and I had my best friend over, and we were hanging out in the kitchen talking to my mum. Mum was cooking dinner and me and my friend were just chatting away. My brother then appears from his room. Where's dinner? he asked. Still another 13 minutes away, Mum replies. But you just came into my bedroom and told me dinner was ready. We all froze still, silent. Chills ran up the back of my spine as I remembered the incident that happened a year prior. No, I didn't, Mum responded. Yes, you did, my brother exclaimed. You knocked, opened my door, walked into my room, and told me that dinner was ready. I can vouch for my mom that she did not do this. After all, I was with her the entire time. My brother shook his head, perhaps I'm imagining things, and walked back to his room. I knew he wasn't imagining things. From there, things got weird, but only for me. My brother never had another experience and neither did my mom. My placid dog, a big fat golden lab, would jump up from her sleep and growl and bark at the corner of the room. Doors that I closed would open up behind me, and I always, always felt like something did not want me there. Fast forward a few years, I had moved out of home and was asked by my mom to dog sit while she went away for the weekend. I did. It was a hot summer night, and I was in the spare bedroom with the air conditioning on freezing cold. Then, at the exact same time, the air conditioning turned off, my phone went to do not disturb, and the bedroom door flung open. I don't mean the door creaked open, I mean flung, as if someone swung it open in anger. I jumped up and ran out of the room, calling my boyfriend freaking out. He calmed me down, and for whatever reason, I stayed at the house. As a horror film fanatic, I know that this was a dumb move. It then came time for bed, so I went to take the dog outside to go potty before bringing her back in. She's a stubborn old thing, so I have to physically go outside and stand in the backyard with her, otherwise she will not go. Whilst we were outside and the dog was sniffing around trying to find her toilet spot for that evening, I felt... something. I don't know how to describe it, because I didn't actually see anything, but I felt something that looked like my mother at the end of the backyard, standing and looking directly at me. I know that sounds weird, but the feeling was so strong. People will say it was your mind playing tricks on you, but it wasn't because I have never before nor since had a feeling like that. It was like I was seeing something without actually seeing it. I sensed it. And I sensed it strong. She was in a nightgown, blonde shoulder-length hair, looking just like my mother, except cold and motionless, and angry. I rushed the dog back inside and went to bed. Needless to say, I didn't sleep well that night. Whatever it was imitating my mother, it did not like me. It never showed itself to my mom or brother, but for some reason loved to torment me. That was until recently. I was over at my mom's for dinner and the topic of ghost stories came up. I brought up all the experiences I'd had at that house, and how I found it so strange that mom never experienced it. Mum looked at me with a blank stare, almost as if she was trying to hold something in. What is it? I asked. Well, the other week, something happened. She began to tell me the story, which finally made her realize I was telling the truth. Except this time it imitated someone else. Mum was with her friend on the balcony having some tea. 
Hey, where's the bathroom? Her friend asked. Just down the hallway, Mum replied. Her friend then got up to go to the bathroom. From the balcony, you can pretty much see everything from the house as it looked straight down the hallway. Mum looked down, drinking her afternoon tea, and when she looked back up, she saw her friend walk out of the toilets and into my mom's bedroom. Hey, friend's name, Mum shouted out. What are you doing? No response. Friend's name? Mum shouted a bit more, getting up from her seat to go and see why she went into her room. Just as she was about to walk down the hall, there appeared her friend, walking out of the toilet. There was nobody in her bedroom. I don't know what this thing is that imitates people in my mom's house, but I know it's not nice. It's not friendly, and it does not want me around. All I can say is, I'm glad that I moved the hell out. Has anyone else experienced anything like this? Hey, Raven. I wanted to start by saying that I love the stories that you tell, especially the paranormal and glitch ones. I actually have a haunting story about the house that my dad and stepmom live in that I've wanted to send you for a bit now, but just haven't had the chance. It's not really relevant, but it does help explain some things. I'm 17 and my parents are divorced. Me and my sister spend every other weekend and all summer at my dad's house. And I have to say that that house is seriously haunted. I have a few experiences that I could share, quite a few actually, but here are just a couple of the ones that I think are the most interesting. One of the first events to mention, and is actually something that has happened more than once, is the weirdness with the front door security camera. We have a camera that's mounted and that watches the front door on the inside. And in part of the frame, you can actually see down into the basement area, specifically a door to what is the laundry room. More than once, one of us has been watching the camera and seen someone else in the family walking out of the room and to the right. With how the camera is positioned, you can't see the full person but can see part of their head and shoulder for a second or two. The first time it happened, I had taken my sister and brother to get lunch and we walked to the McDonald's down the street. We'd been out for a little bit, finishing up our food, when my dad called me. I answered, and he asked me what my sister was doing in the laundry room. I looked at her and laughed and said that we weren't even home, that we'd gone out to get lunch, and then asked her if she had gone into the laundry room at all today. My dad cut me off and said, No, just now. I just now watched her on the camera and she walked into the laundry room. I once again reiterated that we hadn't been home for about half an hour, and that she said she hadn't been in there. After a bit of confused back and forth, he told me that he was going to head home and that, if we got there before he did, to not go inside. I think that he was thinking it was an intruder or something, but when we all got there and he walked through, there was no one there. The doors were all locked and there was nothing out of place. He showed us on the footage from the app that there was absolutely someone that looked like my sister walking into the laundry room, but something felt off about it. Like it wasn't solid, if that makes sense. This actually happened several more times last summer, but it wasn't just my sister. I saw my dad and stepmom walk in at different times. He saw me walking out of the room. My stepmom saw my dad. It was crazy that it happened so many times, and each time it was impossible for any of us to have actually gone into that room. In the end, we chalked it up to some kind of spirit that just liked to appear as people in the house. It seemed to never do anything malicious. It just kind of randomly appeared and walked into the laundry room as random people in the family. The other thing that happens frequently is the strange voices that we all hear from time to time. I have no idea if these are connected to the mimic spirit in the basement, but it would make sense since it seems to copy those of us that are here. 
on several occasions, we've all heard someone else in the family talking nearby when the person is nowhere near us. The first time it happened, I was 14, and it was actually my stepmom that experienced it. She was in her room, sorting out laundry, when she heard me screaming. Like, in pain or completely terrified screaming. She threw the clothes down and ran into the living room hollering for me, and then shouted to my dad asking where I was. He reminded her that I was on a mission trip with the church that weekend, and asked what was wrong. She explained what she heard, and he told her that he didn't hear it. And after just kind of looking around the house and asking my siblings, my stepmom decided that she was just hearing things. Then, literally the next day, it was around 2 in the morning, and my dad said that he was having major trouble sleeping. Like, he was having some serious insomnia and hadn't fallen asleep. He decided to get up and go watch some TV in the living room to see if he could finally fall asleep. And the second he walked into the living room, he said that he heard me screaming for help. In a panic, he ran to my room and threw the door open, but then remembered that I still wasn't home. He told my stepmom about it, and they both kind of just kept quiet about it, thinking that it would scare us kids. After that, I had a similar experience with hearing my dad calling for me when he wasn't home. My sister crying while she was asleep in her bedroom, and I've heard my little brother outside talking to me when he was down in the basement playing the PlayStation. Again, I don't know if this is related to the other spirit, but it very well could be. And if so, I would say that this activity is a bit more malicious than just showing up on the camera. So, that's my experience. And overall, I know that it isn't incredibly terrifying, but it's scary for those of us that stay there. And obviously my dad, stepmom, and younger brother, who live there full time. It's been less and less over the last couple years, but when it was happening, it was pretty frequent. I'm curious if any of your listeners have anything similar to this, but if not, then hopefully they can get a bit of chill from my story at the very least. I work at an average Americanized Italian restaurant as a waitress. It isn't the most popular place in town, but it certainly isn't the worst place either. Before you ask, no, it is not Olive Garden. Sometimes we'll put discounts out online, or in the paper, so people can come in and get the food cheaper. This is relevant to part of the issue that we had with them. We tend to get a lot of suburban moms and their kids, especially at lunchtime. We didn't have any more tables other than one that was reserved, and a woman came in with her three children. They all had to be under ten years old. She argued with the hostess, but this isn't exactly unusual. I don't really know what happened because I'm not the hostess, and I was just focusing on my job. One of my tables left, and then she was seated in my section. When I walked over, said hello, and asked if she was ready to order, she looked at me as though I was dirt under her shoe. People aren't always polite to wait staff, so I ignored it and kept going. I had a feeling that I wasn't going to get much of a tip. Her and her kids ordered their meals, I put the order in and brought them their drinks. She didn't look up from her phone to say thank you, but her kids did. Again, not exactly uncommon. I told them that their food would be done soon, left and went to deal with some other tables. I didn't see what happened as I was in the kitchen getting plates for another table, when I heard loud screaming coming from inside. I saw her standing up and yelling at another woman. Both of them were screaming at the top of their lungs, pushing each other, and then they had some sort of awkward slap fight. Outside of a workplace, it almost would have been funny. But their kids nearly got hit in the process. I put the plates down and went to try to get to the bottom of what was going on. 
something about accidentally hitting each other with their chair, I guess? Rather than apologizing, the two women decided to make a scene. One threatened us by saying she was going to tell her husband who was a judge, and the other was threatening to sue us. Neither of them listened when I asked them to stop. My manager, who is pretty cool, came over and told them that they were embarrassing themselves. They argued with her for a while before the other customers started to get incredibly angry about having their meals disturbed. They started telling the two women to shut up, and it broke into the two women just paying and then leaving. All of their kids looked so damn embarrassed by how their parents were behaving. But this isn't the end of it. I don't know who did it, but they started flooding all of our social media with bad reviews from fake accounts, and saying the food was terrible and that the staff was even worse. Okay, fair enough. Wait it out and it'll fade. But we would then start getting fake bookings that started to negatively impact the business itself, so we had to change the system. We guessed it was one of the two because there hadn't been any other issues before. These things were both pretty tame compared to what happened next. I got a text from my manager asking me to come in a little early, and when I came in, there was paint all over the windows. The plants outside had been smashed and broken, and finally we had some camera footage to let us know who it was. And you guessed it, one of the Karens came back to get back at us. We finally had proof, so... The staff had to clean up her mess, and the owners made a report to the police. She was charged for it. We then started to receive angry phone calls about trying to ruin the life of a mother. The husband finally came in, paid us off, apologized for her behavior, and the charges were dropped. We still randomly get the negative reviews. I'll never come here ever again, this is a terrible restaurant, blah blah. I came to work one day, and sure enough, the non-vandalizing Karen was seated at a table with the menu, and was super quiet in comparison to how she was. So much for her ranting comment. She was served, she paid quietly, and left with no drama. Overall, it was pretty anticlimactic. Until we realized that she tried lying by saying the staff was treating her unfairly, and even threatened her. The manager told her that, after everything... She was lucky she was even permitted inside the store, and she told us that she would be coming back. So, yeah, that's my encounter with two Karens. Oh, and if she does come back, and causes any trouble at all, I'll send that story in. Thanks, Raven. You have an awesome channel. Thank you. Okay, this one is a doozy. Apologies if I get things wrong grammatically, as I'm extremely paranoid at the moment. I live in the UK, Devon, with my dog. It's important to note that there's a huge expanse of woods behind the house. Early last month, this thing that looks and sounds exactly like me began to show itself directly to me. But I fear it's actually been around for much, much longer. About four years ago, my parents, grandmother, and cousins were over at mine for a get-together. I remember my mother going to smoke around the back. Not even a minute after going out, she comes back in all flustered and asking me why I was outside in the woods. She said as I was staring at her blankly. The thing is, I wasn't. I was inside with my grandmother and my dad. My mom bless her soul, passed it off as just seeing things. Stupidly, so did I. Cut to last year, I was in my lounge when my dog ran off into the conservatory barking like mad. This wasn't really surprising as we do have quite a few rabbits and other vermin around the area. That was until, I kid you not, I heard my freaking voice talking in the conservatory. I checked outside, nothing. Nothing at all. Last month, while cleaning the kitchen, I saw me outside in the woods. It looked one-to-one -one with me. This thing didn't move an inch. 
It was like a statue. I froze in place. I guess it was more the shock of seeing myself with my own two eyes physically. I leapt over to the conservatory door, and it was gone. In the split time it took me to go to the door, this thing was gone. Last Saturday, I was upstairs on a work assignment when I heard my freaking voice asking to be let in. My dog was going nuts and got worse when this thing was clawing and scratching at my windows and door. I contacted the police, and I'm away at my parents' house for the time being. I don't know what to tell people or if they'll even believe me. I just want this to end. Any advice? Because I'm dreading when I see this thing again. Or what it'll do. The original poster did add a second post to this, so I would like to include the information. Apologies for my lack of response to y'all's replies. I'm not that involved with online stuff, unfortunately. Thank you so much for all your replies and suggestions. I wasn't expecting such a response. I've read most of the replies on that thread and thought I would answer a few of them on this post. Feel free to ask any more questions below, as I'll get back to as many of them as I can. Number 1. Mental Health I saw quite a few of y'all mention this in the last post. I don't suffer from any mental health issues. I think the most I have is a short temper, but that's besides the point. Unless I need to protect myself in the future from this thing. I'll double check though. Number 2. How do we know you're the real you, huh? Thanks for the chuckle. First one I've gotten in a while. Number three, get some carbon monoxide monitors and set up cameras. I don't know how I didn't think to do this in the first place, but thank you for reminding me to do so. Will do. I'll double check the carbon monitors, especially as I've been experiencing migraines and generally feeling unwell recently. Cams are a go-to, so I'll get some installed. 4. Maybe it's future you time-traveling to the past to warn you. Well, I won't be getting any sleep tonight. <laughs> Interesting thought. 5. I literally live in Devon, and I'm freaking out reading this post. Whereabouts are you? As I said on the last post, I'm currently at my parents, in Exeter. But I live just outside Totnes. Number six. Was it clothed? Was it wearing my clothes? Yes. I have a flannel shirt that I wear often, and it was wearing that. I'll ask my mother if it was also wearing the shirt when she saw it. Seven. Is this fiction? Believe me. I wish. As I said, I'll get some cameras up and running to capture this thing next time it decides to show up. As I said... Please ask any more questions that I missed here, and I'll get back. Thank you all, again. For context, this happened just last night, and is among other things going on. My grandmother lives by herself in a little double-wide, out back, there is a big backyard, a huge field that a neighbor farms, and woods behind that. I've always gotten the sensation something was out in those fields, older than the land, almost a part of the land. Last night, she fell and dislocated her shoulder. My parents took her to the ER, and I volunteered to keep watch overnight with her. As soon as I stepped foot into that house, I felt a pressure and an unclean feeling come over me. All through the night, my skin was crawling and I just felt unclean, like something was in the house with us. This morning, I came back home, and my mom told me something that has me coming here for answers. She said that when she was helping my grandma out of the car that night, she saw something walk through the backyard. She said the best word she could use to describe it was werewolf. She said it was tall, gangly, and on all fours with eye shine. She's also felt the unclean feeling. I know a little bit about skinwalkers, and what she described sounded a lot like one. I also study the paranormal, so I'm also of a negative spirit as the culprit. 
if it is a skinwalker, would Catholic prayers and blessings work? Or would I need something else? Hello, Raven. I want to thank you again for reaching out to me to let me know about my stories. I decided that I would just sit here and go through the years in my head. It seems like the best way to remember things that have happened to me in my life. This happened back in 1977. I was a lot younger then, that's for sure. Well, I was driving back home from a band practice. Yes, I was in a band. I had been in many bands for over 50 years, met a lot of people. I had gotten together with a couple of guys locally, and we had finished practice for the evening, and this one guy and I have to drive a little more than 30 miles to get back to town where we both lived. Back then, it was no big deal to travel 70 miles somewhere just to practice. The guy with me had been in the service, and as you recall, that was the Vietnam era when he was in. So, he was no weenie. He had seen and been through some tough stuff, but he made it home. Now, he just wanted to enjoy his life and play music. I was driving and we had gone through two small towns on our way to our own. About halfway between the last small town and ours is a state park. Back then, they had just made a new entrance to the park. Now, you could pull directly into the park off the highway, instead of having to go down a country road and down a long dirt road to enter the park. There was a median that separated the lanes of traffic back then, but back then, it was one that used to be raised about five to six inches. They've since done away with that raised cement, as it was probably found to be dangerous that way. Now, the road is divided merely with the white lines. We were heading south, and it was around 11 at night. Slightly foggy, but you could see a quarter mile easily enough. We were just getting near the park area, and we were discussing some of the issues we were having with a certain song. Up ahead, I could see a van with those yellow fog lights on, and a car followed by another car, headed towards us. There was no one behind us. We had just started to enter the division point where the sign was, right in the middle, and the van went past. Then, I saw something running across the road behind the van. The park was on our left, right there. Whatever it was, had come from the park area and run across, through the traffic, heading for the other side of the highway. It looked like it may be four feet tall, and was covered with black or dark brown hair that looked to be about three inches long. It was running on two legs for sure, and was going to end up right in front of my car. I swerved to the right and then pulled back left to try and miss it. It jumped back and had grabbed the dividing sign with its right arm, and the other arm went out to the side. I swear if I had had my window down and my arm out, I would have been able to slap it in the face. It was that close. We got past it, and I then yelled at my friend, did you see that? He looked like he saw it better than I did. He was really rattled. All he would repeat saying was, Keep going, keep going. I said that I wanted to turn around and see if we could find it. He kind of yelled at me. No, no, keep going. He would not let me turn that car around. I never saw him like that before. Now this guy had been in the military and had seen action so he was no chicken. I kept on our way home, and I went to drop him off at his house. He got out and went in. Didn't say goodbye, see ya, nothing. It had really upset him. I never brought it up with him after that night. I don't think he ever mentioned it to anyone. I myself only mentioned it to a couple of close friends, and, of course, they looked at me funny. My friend passed away several years ago from liver failure due to drinking heavily. So, I don't have my friend, or a witness to this, anymore. And that was before I had ever heard about this stuff about Bigfoot or Sasquatch. 
years later, I still often wonder if that was what we saw that night. Then, after all that time, I realized something. I thought of something that I hadn't even considered. If that was a juvenile Bigfoot, how close was Mom and Dad? Hello, Raven. It's Amy again. I have a friend who lives in Colorado, and just recently, she had a very scary experience involving one of her neighbors. She gave me full permission to share this story to your channel, and just asked that I gave her a fake name and different location for the story. I hope that you enjoy this one. It was a very scary experience for her, but in the end, she is okay, safe, and the issue was resolved. Back in spring of 2022, I, a 39-year-old female, had just purchased my first home in a small town in Michigan, to be closer to my family. Growing up in a somewhat low-income family, I was more than excited and proud to have finally purchased my own house. I was single, no kids, no pets, and this was a big milestone for me. The house was a bit smaller, definitely single-family sized, with just two bedrooms, one bathroom and one level. But it was more than enough for me. My backyard had no fence, and it also led to the neighbor's backyard, who also didn't have a fence. The neighbor, who I didn't formally get to meet, appeared to be in his mid-fifties, average height, and had a few tattoos on his arm. Now, I'm a pretty private sort of person, so I didn't make notes to go over and introduce myself to him, and vice versa. We both kept to ourselves. But that soon changed. About maybe a month into moving in, I woke up one morning, a cup of coffee in my hand, and was about to sit on my porch that overlooked my backyard. I remember it was on a Saturday because I didn't have to go into work that day, and was planning on enjoying a quiet morning peacefully, just enjoying my coffee and reading on my porch. However, when I stepped out, I noticed something that I was not expecting to find in my yard. My neighbor, who I'll just refer to in this story as AJ, had installed a small chain-link fence. Now, most of you, including myself, would at first think, there's no problem with that as long as it's on the neighbor's property line. But when I took a better look, I noticed there was a door on the fence. Basically, the gate was right in the middle of the fence that would open right up into my backyard. Curious, I walked over to closer inspect the fence and did see that the gate door was in fact installed to go between my yard and the neighbor's yard. Most fences, when installed in a backyard, are intended to run along the perimeter of the side between each property. So having an open gate door seemed... odd. I decided not to say anything to the neighbor about this, just noting that it was weird and put the issue in the back of my mind. However, about a week later, as I was once again coming out onto my porch... I noticed something lying in the middle of my backyard. I walked over and saw that it was an empty beer bottle. I bent down and picked it up, and I noticed the gate between my yard and AJ's yard was left wide open. I looked around and didn't see AJ was anywhere in sight, but I could only assume that the empty beer bottle and open fence door were his doing. This definitely became a red flag for me, and I started to make more notes of being wary of him. Things quickly escalated, and the next morning when I woke up, I was making my morning coffee and had heard a thud on my porch. I quickly opened my back door and stepped onto my porch to see my neighbor sitting on one of my chairs, smoking a cigarette. He didn't even look surprised when I saw him. Appalled and even a little scared, I asked him what he was doing on my property. He just smiled at me and shrugged his shoulders. 
I again demanded to know why he was on my property, and I asked him to leave immediately. Again, he sort of just shrugged his shoulders, and stood up and walked off the porch. He left through the open fence door, while I angrily shouted at him to not come back onto my property again. At first, finding the empty beer bottle and open gate had me aware, but now I was on high alert and scared about this. I talked to a few friends and family members about it, and they suggested that I start installing a security camera on my back porch so I can have physical evidence if AJ should ever return onto my property. So, I did just that, and with the help of my brother-in-law, the camera was installed. My sister also argued that if the door on his fence was opening into my yard, I should go as far as putting a padlock on the door to prevent AJ from being able to come onto my yard. I didn't think that was necessary. Now that I had the camera installed, I felt a little more at peace about the situation. A few weeks later, it's around 9 or 10 at night, I'm in my bedroom, curled up in bed with my book, when my phone notifies me of movement spotted on the security camera. I pull up the camera footage, and to my horror, I see my neighbor standing on my porch, and seemingly checking out the door. Fortunately, it was locked, but the camera live feed showed him actually trying the doorknob. Horrified, I press on the microphone button for my camera and tell him that I can see him, and tell him that he needs to get off my property right now. AJ looks up at the camera and gives that same non-caring smile and shouts that he just wants to talk to me. I repeat to him to leave and that I would be calling the police. I jump out of my bed and phone the police, all while watching AJ just standing on my porch. To sum it up, he eventually left before the police arrived, but they did issue him a trespass warning, and no, this still wasn't the end of it. From then on, I did not feel comfortable even stepping onto my own backyard. Any yard work I did, I dreaded doing in worry that AJ would be outside and that he would try to approach me. I did start the process of getting a privacy fence installed in my yard, just for extra security measures. I also would still find an empty beer bottle or two lying in my yard, to which I finally took the advice of my sister and put a padlock onto the fence door, in hopes of preventing him from being able to enter my yard. Still, this did not deter him. My security camera showed him break the padlock and open the door. When this happened, I had rushed out, phone in hand, and recording him on my phone as another form of evidence of him trespassing onto my property again. He actually had the audacity to yell at me for placing a padlock on his fence, while I argued back that he was now trespassing on my property, even after being given trespass warnings by the police. Eventually, I got my privacy fence installed. I had hoped that this would finally put a stop to AJ, and yet, this only showed how much further he was willing to go to trespass and enter my property. I had actually recorded him climbing over my privacy fence and jumping into my yard. As usual, I had to demand that he leave and that he was being recorded. Then, the worst had yet to happen. It had been around a few months of this constant war with AJ, when I was awoken one night, around 2.30 in the morning, to a loud crashing sound at my front door. Startled, confused, and terrified, I snatched the golf club that I had been keeping underneath my bed and went out into the hallway to investigate. To my absolute shock, my front door had been kicked in. It was still on its hinges, but the door was kicked in so hard that when I went to check the damage, I realized I wouldn't be able to close or lock it. I quickly dialed the police and my parents to tell them what had happened. By the time both the police and my parents had gotten to my house, I was a mess. The emotional trauma and terror over the last two months had finally taken its toll on me, 
and now I was outright terrified for my life. The police went next door and questioned AJ, and thanks to my recordings and previous history of AJ being served with the trespassing warnings and complaints, he was served a restraining order, and after that, he had finally stopped harassing me. Within that same year, he ended up moving away for good. I know this story isn't as scary as a lot of the others that you hear or have probably read, but this experience still terrified me. I had a neighbor who completely disrespected my privacy and my personal property. I still have no clue what his motives were each time I'd catch him on my property, or how much worse it could have gotten. I'm just beyond thankful that I never have to deal with him again and can finally put it behind me. I'm going to start this off by saying that I do follow pagan principles. Not Wiccan, but true folk magic and spiritual practices. And wholeheartedly believe in worlds that are not seen to the naked eye, unless they want us to, that is. I know what I saw and I know what I felt. I've encountered the paranormal many times, as I love to go out to cemeteries and converse with the other side, safely and with correct precautions and conclusions. I'm no stranger to the unknown or unseen. I have encountered a skinwalker and saw it with my own eyes. I haven't felt this scared since my one and only encounter with one. Last night, I, 24 female, was driving from my parents' house. I was out of a job for a while and couldn't afford living on my own, but I found one. I'm a pre-K special education teacher, not a bum, but in need of help. I was going to a friend's house to help her go through her first baby's baby clothes in order to get ready for baby number two. She lives about ten minutes away, and I know her route's like the back of my hand, as I have driven it dozens of times. I'm jamming out to Hamilton, as one does. I'm putting my heart and soul into this one-woman show, and truly feeling the feelings behind each character's lines. I'm pouring my soul into it, and I was in my spiritual happy place. Everything was fine, until it wasn't. I'm about two miles from her house, when I just feel my arms pull me down this road that I have never seen before. I start driving down it and go to turn on my GPS to help me figure something out. It wasn't there. I notice there is one light pull on the road, and I have passed it and there's an overwhelming sense of dread that was growing thicker and heavier every inch my wheels turned. And, oh, I messed up feeling. A this-is-not-safe feeling. I immediately find a way to do a three-point turn and get my happy back end the hell out of Dodge. I get to my friend's house and I'm a shaking mess, pulling everything I needed inside. I tell this to her and her husband, and they look at each other like, WTF, because I'm never scared like that. They start asking me questions about where the road was, what happened, did you see anything, etc. I tell them my skinwalker story, and I told them I have not been this frightened since that day. They were in shock. I immediately did an egg cleanse because that crap was not staying with me all night long and keeping me awake. Needless to say, I was not comfortable going back outside, so I stayed the night with them. I didn't sleep a wink, and I've been up for 30 hours now. I drove home about 30 minutes ago, and that road was not there on my way home. As I'm typing this out, I'm back to shaking like a chihuahua in dead winter without a sweater. Something was calling out to my body while I was out of mine. Thoughts? Answers? Questions? Thank you for reading this far, and I'm sorry if this sounds like a creepypasta, but this was a true encounter of the strange. I 
I've lived in many haunted houses in my life, each with their own experiences and stories, but for the most part, human in nature. This was the first time that I experienced something I would call inhuman. My dad was in the army at the time, and had been stationed to a base in South Carolina. He found a house for rent and showed us pictures of it. It was a single story at the end of a roundabout in the middle of the woods. You could see the other house off in the distance through the trees. I looked at the pictures, and whenever I looked at the pictures of the outside, a voice in my head would start screaming at me. It's in the woods. It's in the woods. Nothing on the inside, just the outside. When we got there, as we were unpacking, a cop pulled up. Never got out of the car, but talked to my mom through the window about how he knew the previous owners, and just wanted to check on things. We never saw the cop again. Whenever I would go outside, I would get the sensation that something was hiding in the tree line, and that it wanted me to follow it. I felt like it was trying to be playful and mischievous. I would also see figures walking by the windows and heard scratching from outside. One night, I woke up hearing something moving around outside. I went to look outside, peeking through the blinds. I saw something crouching in front of the window. If it was standing, it would be on two legs and seven feet tall. Given I could see the silhouette of shoulders and knees, and it was covered in fur, I was freaked out. Days later, my parents had taken my brother to the airport and I was home alone. I was doing laundry and saw that my room was brighter than normal. I figured that I left my bedside lamp on, so I went to turn it off. I stood in my doorway and saw that my lamp was off. Looking up, my ceiling light, which had never worked since we moved in, was on. I texted my mom asking if she had the light fixed. She said no. Eventually, I left for army basic training, but my mom kept me up to date on what was going on. She said that she was hearing the scratches and noises. One night, she was talking to my dad by the door and said that they both heard someone run up on the porch and rattle the door handle. My dad whipped open the door, but nothing was there. We never got answers as to what was in the woods or the house but it was my first experience with an inhuman entity. For context, I am highly skeptical, but I'm no stranger to the paranormal. I'm the type that believes demons exist, but most ghost stories are overreactions of easily explained phenomena, or simply hoaxes. About three months ago, I started working security for a hotel that was built back in the 1920s by a major hotel chain that has changed hands multiple times and is now owned by one of the biggest hotel chains. I'm not saying which, so the company can't sue me. Now, from what I've been told, paranormal activity is not a common occurrence in the hotel, but some years back, the Make-A-Wish Foundation started sending some children here because, well, it's a major resort at one of the most popular beaches on the East Coast, so why wouldn't they? However, the hotel was not informed of this and didn't realize what was happening until several children died in their room over the course of a few weeks. And supposedly, on quiet nights, you can hear children playing with a ball in the North Tower ballrooms at night. For years, guests complained of children playing ball loudly next to their room, and when security would check, there would be no one there. This has not happened in a while, but going into this story, you should understand that my opinion on the cause of what I've seen may be warped by being told this story. Now, every shift we do a floor check, especially on night shift when I work. At first, I never noticed anything strange. I got a little creeped out by the quiet of the floors at night, but nothing supernatural. The hotel has two separate towers, separated by a restaurant and shopping area that connects them. 
about a month into the job, and suddenly I start feeling like something was following me on my floor checks, especially in the South Tower, which is the biggest and tallest. And where I understand most jumpers choose because all the rooms facing the ocean have sliding glass doors with a short railing in front, and you can put the rest together from there. Anyway, it got really bad in October. Maybe the spooky season had an effect on me, but this feeling of being watched and followed never went away. As the weeks have gone on, I started seeing distorted faces in windows as I passed by, to the point that I no longer look at them. The floor pattern sometimes reflects on the glass, and the mind could easily make a face with the pattern, but some of these faces were further up on the glass, or this wouldn't have been possible. When I focus up there sometimes, I can almost hear whispers in the back of my mind, urging me to end my own life, or lambasting me for the mistakes I've made, or even telling me insecurities I have about myself that I've never told anyone about. In the last few weeks, some strange physical and auditory phenomena have occurred. Part of what we do on the floor checks is close doors that we find open, and some of the doors lately have been more difficult to close. One in particular I had to use all of my strength to slam shut. The ice machines on each floor sometimes make a banging noise while in operation, so I usually attribute any noise I hear from the vending area to that. But sometimes, it almost has sounded like something was rummaging in the garbage cans. And when I go to investigate, I would hold my keys so they wouldn't jingle in case it was a person, and as soon as I do, the rummaging noise will stop. On a couple of occasions, I felt what I can only describe as hands touching me while closing certain doors, sometimes just a tickle, and other times a brush against the back of my hand, and even a feeling like someone on the other side of the door is pulling it in the opposite direction against me. I now dread the floor checks especially after 3 a.m. I'm not trying to make this seem scarier than it is, but these things intensify the closer it gets to that hour. Whatever they are, they are not friendly, and I think they know that I can sense them. They really don't like that I can sense them. Like some nights, that watched and followed feeling is more like a burning hatred directed towards my existence, like being stalked by an enemy or a predator. I'm pretty religious, and whenever these things happen, I always pray to God, and when I do, it usually goes away, whatever it is. The scariest thing, though, is the last time it was that intense, I heard something growl next to my ear. I've never been hurt by them, so my assumption is that they can't hurt anyone physically, but they try to communicate often, and they want their presence acknowledged almost as though that's where their power comes from. My grandmother once told me that demons truly have no power, that they're capable of whatever we believe them to be capable of. My mounting fear is feeding them, whatever they are. My experiences could be just me seeing things, or looking too much into something completely explainable. I don't know. This is just what I've seen and heard. Whatever it is hunting me at night, my coworkers don't know about it. Or at least they aren't telling anyone. I am bipolar, but medicated, and I've never had hallucinations. Maybe I'm just crazy and seeing things, but if that's the case, why am I not having any other signs of manic episodes or psychosis? And why am I only seeing things in that one part of the building? I want to make it clear that I don't expect anyone to believe this. As I said to someone else in the comments, ultimately, all I have is my word. But I stand by what I said, and whether you believe me or not, these things did happen to me. I despise people who make stuff up like this, or try to make their story seem scarier by making it look real to gain more traction on a fictional story. It discredits people who really experience these things. If I'm writing fiction, I will note it as such, unless it's obvious. 
the OP did send me a message with some more information, so I would like to include that. For one thing, the overall paranormal activity has reduced over the last few months. When I sense something following me, it feels less malicious. Maybe because I stopped paying them any mind. I still avoid doing floor checks in the South Tower if possible. Sometimes I just have to. Like, right now, actually, as I'm typing this. Now, there have been a handful of incidents that could easily be chalked up to natural phenomena, or just people. However, I had an alarm randomly sound when I pushed a door, and engineering couldn't figure out where it came from. It said the only possible way the alarm could have sounded off is if a person pulled the fire alarm and I was nowhere near it. There's also no way to stop that alarm without human intervention. I was nowhere near it, and even the engineer said he thought that it was a ghost or something. Other than that, we just had a lot of calls about kids pounding on doors, and when we go up to investigate, no one is there, no matter how quickly we respond. This is easier to explain, but I've always wondered, whenever it happens, if it was a person, or some kind of spirit. I used to work at a certain 24-hour diner that serves waffles. The house of waffles, if you will. And honestly, it was probably one of the best jobs that I've ever had. I worked the night shift, and the manager on that shift was super laid back. And as long as we kept the line clean and the customers happy, we were pretty well allowed to do whatever we wanted, within reason. On the night where this happened, it was a rather busy and stressful night, which did happen from time to time. I had just come off of my shift, so it was around 3 o'clock in the morning, I believe, and after having served about 150 waffles, I was pretty well ready to get home and go to bed. The employee parking lot was a small, cramped space off to the back of the diner. It was large enough for only a few cars, and if you worked a full shift, you usually had to park in the front of the building. I had gotten one of the closer spots in the back lot. It was a bit tucked off at the side, and a bit darker than the rest of the lot, but it felt secure enough. Plus, it was the employee lot, so it was surely safer than being out in the main lot with everyone else. Right? Yeah, that was the night that I learned that that was completely wrong. As I approached my car, keys in hand, ready to hit the unlock button, hop in, and head home, I noticed something odd. There was another car that was haphazardly parked in the employee lot. Like they weren't parked in the lot, but off to the side and behind another person's car. I paused and sort of stared at it for a moment, thinking that it was strange. As I was staring at it, I heard the engine turn over and the headlights kicked on. I just kind of thought that it was someone doing something they probably shouldn't have been, and they saw me and realized that they weren't as hidden as they thought. I shrugged it off, thinking they would just go ahead and leave, and kept on towards my car. As I got to my car, I reached my hand in my pocket to grab my phone, only to realize I didn't have it. I had accidentally left it inside. I huffed a bit at my stupidity, shut my door, and started back towards the back entrance of the restaurant. As I was walking back, out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a man getting out of the car that was now sitting there idling. I only saw him out of the corner of my eye, but I knew that he was there, and I knew that he was walking toward me, and I was now extremely nervous. I picked up my pace but the man started shouting for me to hold on and that he wanted to talk to me. He was, unfortunately, faster than I was, and he caught up to me, grabbing my arm. As he grabbed me, I started to scream, and I reached out and banged on the back door as hard as I could, trying to pull away from his grip. I kept screaming and trying to hit or kick the door to get anyone's attention, he kept pulling me away from the door, and I was near certain that this was the end for me. 
this guy was going to get me in his car and drive off. Thankfully, that is not what happened. And me banging on the door was enough to catch the attention of our cook. To describe our cook is to describe the most intimidating man I have ever seen. Though, knowing him, I know that he's also the most kind-hearted giant ever. Andre was a six-and-a-half-foot-tall man that had to be almost 300 pounds. And while Andre had a bit of fat on him from eating the food at our diner, he also liked to hit the weights. And under that slight chubbiness, there was a ton of muscle. And so when he threw the door open and was holding a hammer and came out shouting at the man that had a hold of me, we both jumped. The man took one look at Andre, let me go, and made a mad dash back toward his car. Andre took off toward the car as the guy started to reverse out as fast as he could. I then witnessed what was probably the most terrifying thing I have ever seen. I watched as Andre pulled his arm back and threw the hammer at the windshield, and I swear that hammer went through the damn glass and hit the guy in the face. It definitely broke the windshield, and I'm pretty sure it went all the way through, so he now had a massive crushed spot in the front of his car. The guy gunned it and took off out of the parking lot, leaving me standing there behind Andre, who I now considered my savior. He asked me if I was okay, took me back inside, and we contacted the police. And this was the day that we all learned that the cameras in the back lot, the employee lot, didn't actually work. They had apparently stopped working at some point in the last year or two, and the owner never bothered to get them fixed. He did after this, but it was too little too late. I was given a few days off after this, and when I came back, I was told to park in the closest spot, and the manager implemented a new rule that no one was allowed to walk to their cars alone. Someone had to, at the very least be at the door and watch them get into their car at the end of the shift. I don't work there anymore. Andre does, and he's officially my best friend at this point because that man most likely saved my life. And watching him throw a claw hammer through a windshield was... something else. I have no idea if they caught the guy, but I never heard from them. If nothing else, hopefully Andre scared the hell out of him, and hopefully, he learned his lesson. Working as a bartender at a small chain bar and grill has given me my fair share of stories. Ones that I will most likely send in to you one day, but I have one that I feel is worth sharing because of, well, everything about it. I've seen just about every type of person walk through the door, but literally none of them made as much of a mark on my memory as Eric. Eric was the new guy, just starting off as a bartender after having worked at Starbucks for a couple of years. This was his second shift at the restaurant, and my first shift working with him. From the get-go, something about him felt a bit off. He was quiet, sure, but it was more than that. There was a certain tension, like he was always on edge. That evening started off as every other. The bar filled up, the energy of the room grew. As we got busier, I had to tell Eric to start taking over some smaller tasks, and to let me know if he got any complicated drink orders. That was until a certain regular customer came in that was known to be a bit... extra. He usually got a bit rowdy, he was usually irate over nothing in particular, and he was just kind of an a-hole. That night he was particularly abrasive, hurling his demands and complaints to the point that it was honestly getting on my nerves. I was used to handling difficult customers though, so I approached him, trying to defuse the situation. I tried to talk the guy down, tell him that if he had any issues that I could help him, or if that wasn't enough, I would go get the manager. 
he then said something to the effect of, Well, I wouldn't have any issues if this new guy you're working with wasn't such a... I'm not going to include the last two words. The first one was a slur for someone who is mentally handicapped, and the second was a slur based on the fact that Eric was Hispanic. You can piece it together from that. I tried to interject and tell the man to leave, but before I could get a word in, I watched as Eric's face twisted into one of pure rage. He grabbed a glass bottle from the shelf behind us, smashed it against the counter, and pointed the jagged edge towards the now sober and stunned customer, shouting, Say it again. If you really feel that way, then say it again. Come on, own it. Say what you think of me one more time. The entire restaurant just kind of froze and watched as Eric held the glass, and the customer just stared at him with his eyes wide and his mouth open. Then, instinct kicked in, and I rushed over to grab Eric to try to calm him down. After a few seconds, Eric nodded and handed me the bottle, ending the standoff with, Seems you don't have the stones to really say what you think, huh? And the customer didn't wait for anything else to be said, as he jumped up and stumbled away from the bar. I want to add that I could tell that this man had visibly peed his pants. And I'm adding this because, while Eric's reaction was definitely more violent than what would be appropriate, I didn't feel bad for that customer at all. His racist and demeaning remark were just disgusting. And he was always like that, so it was almost satisfying to see him get put in his place. Obviously, Eric was let go on the spot, and the police did get involved. They took Eric in, and they asked us a bunch of questions. I told them that the man was provoking Eric, and that while he overreacted, the other man was not innocent. This night really showed me that there are some people that you just shouldn't mess with, and that some people carry more rage inside them than what is obvious and I really hope that Eric didn't get too much trouble for what happened. That customer, who, like I mentioned, was a regular, never came back to the bar. The restaurant also tightened their hiring process a bit, and we all had to take a class on de-escalation and how to handle rude customers. But the manager also implemented a zero-tolerance rule. If a customer then said anything disparaging like that, we were told to get the manager, and that they would then kick them out on the spot. This is going to be a bit of a long post, so I'll just start at the beginning. I have always experienced paranormal things, and my earliest memory of anything paranormal was age four. I have many stories of things I've witnessed in my lifetime, but this is one from my time living in rural Missouri. In 2009, I moved in with my boyfriend, now husband, and his family. They lived in a beautiful farmhouse on several acres of land. The nearest neighbor was probably half a mile down the road, so it was very quiet. This home has a large basement that was basically a two-bedroom apartment, and that's where my husband and I lived. As soon as I moved in, I started to notice strange sounds and see things. I didn't mention these things to him because I didn't want him to think I was crazy. It would take me a long while to type out every single instance of what we witnessed, but I'll tell you the ones that still scare me to this day, when I think back. Right outside of our bedroom door was a long hallway that led to the staircase, and another bedroom. We were the only two people to ever go into the basement. One night, we were already in bed and watching TV, when we began to hear extremely heavy footsteps pacing up and down the hallway. It was so heavy that we thought maybe someone had broken into the house, and was wearing heavy work boots or something. We turned the television off and started to listen closely. It would pass by our door and seem to go towards the end of the hall and then would come back near the door. At this point, our dog was growling and looking towards the door. With the TV off, the bedroom was pitch black dark. My husband called out, Hello? The sound of the boots stopped. 
He started to text his mother, the only other person home that night, and he asked her if she was downstairs. She responded that she was sleeping. My husband started to get up and find out who was in the house. He made it about halfway to the door, and all of a sudden, the door literally flew open. It was such a force that the knob knocked a small hole into the wall. At that point, our dog went crazy and was barking, and ran to hide under a table. The bedroom was still extremely dark, so my husband tried to hurry and turn the lights on. The lights come on. Silence. He runs into the hallway looking around. We both searched the entire basement and found nothing. One night, we're sitting in the living room area in the basement watching television. Behind the living room area was a kitchen area that had a long bar. We had a few bar stools up on the bar and a telephone on a charger. In this particular night, we were the only ones at home as everyone else had gone out to dinner. We start to hear a weird sound, almost like someone was moving furniture across the floor. We lower the volume on the TV so we can hear things better, and we hear something moving again. All of a sudden, we hear a very loud crashing sound right behind the couch. We then feel something hit the back of the couch. We both jumped up terrified and looked behind us. Two of the bar stools that were on the bar are now on the floor behind the couch. Keep in mind, the kitchen area sat back about 14 or 15 feet from where the couch is. If they simply fell somehow, there was no possible way that they traveled like that. The phone that was on the other end of the bar was about 10 feet away on the floor and ripped from the charger. We looked around, and we literally ran up the stairs and outside until we could calm down. I was absolutely terrified and feared the basement after that. We started to see what looked like a possible shadow figure standing in doorways. Each time we would see it, it was just standing there and would slowly move away. It got to the point that we would try to ignore it until it went away. We told his mom and stepdad, and they told us that they saw and heard things frequently, too. We would be upstairs and hear the toilet flush in the bathroom. We would then hear the water in the sink turn on, and then silence. At night, if we would come upstairs and walk through the house while the lights were off, you would just feel as though you were being watched. We made the mistake of trying to hold a seance one evening... We wanted to ask and see what was there, or maybe what they wanted. We were sitting in the kitchen upstairs in the main part of the house. There's an arched doorway to exit the kitchen, and just to the right as you walk through the arched doorway was the stairs leading back down to the basement. As we are asking if anyone would like to talk to us, we hear what sounds like someone running up the stairs from the basement. It was very heavy footsteps. His mom and little sister were with us at the table. We all four jumped up scared as hell. We all looked at the doorway to see who was coming up the stairs. As soon as it seemed like it was nearing the top of the stairs, it went silent. We all had to go outside until we were calmed and had the courage to come back inside. These are just a few examples out of many more things that we have witnessed while living there. I asked my husband if he had noticed any of these things happening before now. He said that things happened, but nowhere near as bad as once I moved in. His mother told me the same thing. We ended up going to the library and speaking with a local historian. She told us that in the late 70s, a young woman had committed suicide in the home, in the basement. She told us that a very young woman who lived in the home had become very depressed and she ended her life in the area right by the basement kitchen. Immediately, things started to make sense. I have so many more experiences in the house, if anyone would like to hear them.